Welcome back, everyone, to Open Line, talking about Women's History Month, some of the women who shaped our city, shaped our state, and really, I feel like it's story time. We have with us Dr. Carol Busey. She is a local historian telling us all kinds of fascinating stories. I've really enjoyed it. Uh, we're going to go to the phones now. So let's go to Ann. Hello, Ann. Hey, y'all. Ann. Hey, Miss Busey. Hello. Um, I just would like people to know that are new to Nashville that listening to you tonight, I've listened to you for decades here in the Middle Tennessee area, area and the way you talk about history, the way you tell Nashville stories is what I basically came up with here in Nashville. Uh, you're keeping this alive in, in the way you deliver the stories, the way you tell them, is the way that I've met many Nashvilleans in my lifetime tell our stories here. And it's refreshing tonight to hear you tell some of these stories in that style. Uh, I just want to say that uh, I was surprised to find a grandmother of mine in a history book. I think Stanley Horn wrote this book. And uh, it led me to calling Mr. Walter Durham here a few years ago before he passed away to ask him about an oath that he had cited and my grandmother. And what I liked about you and people like you in this area that did our history, you were all, always gracious with your time and your knowledge. You, none of you guys were ever, ever arrogant about holding anything back. And it was like listening to a story and finding a new story every time I talked to one of you guys. But I'm going to ask you tonight, if you're familiar, and I want to thank you, you're one of the women that we should be talking about <laughs> Siding you, Miss Busey, and I know your head's probably going, oh my goodness. What did you have for dinner tonight? Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm most gracious. But have you ever heard of a woman from South Nashville? I think she lived around the Edmondson neighborhood with the sculptor. Uh huh. She was a black woman. Her last name was Barry. I read a book about her, and she was the woman who started the push for black appropriations. Can you speak on her if you know anything about her? Tell us some more stories. I'm, I'm on the edge of my seat here. Thank you. Good night. All well, right. you know, Mary Frances Berry is a, 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 a contemporary woman, but she's had a great deal of influence here in Tennessee, and I'm not sure whether that's who you're thinking about or whether you're thinking about somebody else. Do you? Can you give me the first name? Oh, well, she's gone. Oh, she's so gone. So we lost well, Anne. Well, I will check on that. <laughs> and the next time you are where I am speaking, uh, you can bring this subject up again. How about that? So I'll, I'll ask you some more specifics, you know, people, and we'll hear more stories. But I do like, I like what Ann just said there, that it is like story time. And, and you feel like, as a historian, that it has to be told in that way, right? I mean, it's, it's a certain way of, of kind of conveying history. And you think that's kind of a good way to do it, right? I do think that history needs to begin with you and your story. And you have a family, and as she brought up the subject of, she learned about one of her ancestors. And you're connected to the story. And so you, rather than starting with United States history, and I have many students at the community college who have never been to Washington, D.C. They haven't been to New York City. And yet, they know more about U.S. history than they do about their own family history or about Tennessee in their local community. And so I like to reverse it and think that history begins with you and you have these concentric circles that keep going further and further out, including more and more, rather than starting on the outside and trying to work your way to the inside of the story. And you've got to connect yourself to the events of U.S. history for it to mean anything at all to you. You've got to be connected to those women who saved their sugar during the war rationing of World War II so that they could put their sugar all together and bake a child a birthday cake. You've got all of those stories in your family that have never been recorded, but it's pretty easy to find your the male's history if they had any military activity whatsoever, even if they were just private 
units in the Army uh, or low-ranking officers in the uh, 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 service, service men in other uh, branches of the United States military. So we, I feel like in, in our history here, we've come up to the Civil War. What's another woman that inspires you that we should know more about that we may not know about? Who, let's, who, who's next? Well, I would say we know some things about Ida B. Wells and the Nashville Public Library's new Votes for Women room has a very nice exhibit that is basically a debate between Ida B. Wells and uh, the, the head of the woman's suffrage, I mean, not woman's suffrage, the head of the woman's Christian temperance union. And so this debate really gives her a show place here in Nashville that she's never had before. But Ida B. Wells was an African-American woman who had been born as a child to enslaved parents in Mississippi before the Civil War. Her, uh, after the Civil War, of course, they were freed, but they were in Mississippi, and her parents both died in an epidemic, and she ended up taking the responsibility for some younger siblings and moved into Memphis, where she began teaching some uh, in some schools in Memphis for African-American children, and then then she began editing an African-American newspaper and she got involved with a group in Memphis who were trying to help African-Americans in Memphis. And so one of her friends had joined a partnership with two other African-American men to start a grocery store, the People's Grocery. And the long and short of this story is that uh, there was a raid on the People's Grocery and the three African Americans were killed. And as a result of this, Ida B. Wells was in, enraged because they were taken out of their grocery store where they had been sleeping to try to protect it, taken out to the edge of Memphis and shot. Now that is a lynching. Anytime a person is killed by a group willfully judging them without a trial, that is a lynching. And they became very common across the South in the 1880s, 90s, 1910s, 1920s, even up to the 30s, and yes, even up to the 40s. Well, Ida B. Wells said, I am not going to, to take this silently. And so she began writing in her newspaper, and of course the editor of the Memphis commercial paper was none other than the man whose uh, statue has uh, recently come down here uh, of Edward Ward Carmack. He was the newspaper editor in Memphis before he became a U.S. senator and then got his statue up. I'll tell that story next. But <laughs> nonetheless, Ida B. Wells, uh, uh, he criticized her very very directly in his newspaper referring to her as that black wench and uh, wow. she, then her newspaper office was burned down so she ended up living the rest of her life in Chicago but she launched a national and international campaign against lynching and she carried the stories of what was going on how African American primarily men but often there were women who were lynched as well, uh, carried those stories all over the world. And she happened to be in London uh, at one point when Francis Willard, the head of the WCTU, was there, and they kind of got into a, a discussion through the newspapers. Fascinating. Okay. Dr. Carol Busey is here, local historian, Volunteer State Community College. Right, we're going to take a break. We'll come back, continue our discussion right after this. Now...